That's a very good point. And it's a human system that's trying to yeah, generate yeah. it. But, um, Humans don't count. This week on Backward Compatible, Doc and Chris are joined by Isaac Karth and Alex Swain to explore the subject of procedural generation in games. Plus, impressions of The Witness, Firewatch, Oxenfree, Roll for the Galaxy, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 58 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm joined tonight by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we have some new, very special guests with us today. we got Isaac Karth. Hi there. And we have Alex Swaim. Hello. And uh, guys, how about you introduce yourselves real quick? I am Alex Swaim. I'm currently a programmer for a small game studio in Dallas uh, called Bonus XP. Uh we just recently shipped a game uh, called The Incorruptibles out now on iOS and Android. Please download uh, and rate it favorably. And before that, I got my Master of Fine Arts in Arts and Technology at the University of Texas at Dallas. I've heard of that place. <laughs> yeah, some little school out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Isaac? I'm Isaac Karth. I'm probably best described these days as a computational artist working in the intersection between... The warmth of the humanities and the cold logic of the machine. <laughs> oh, I like it. So ATEC, basically. Basically, yes. <laughs> so you're like a Terminator. I'll go with that. It's like a Terminator whisperer. Oh, oh nice. Oh, nice. I see. <laughs> so you're John Connor. I... <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Wait, Are you from the future? Also no comment. Are you really my dad? <laughs> Definitely no comment. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> Very nice. The biggest project I'm working on right now is stuff related to my blog, procedural-generation.tumblr.com. Go there. That's a lot of dots. It is. Nice. <laughs> it we ran out. We... No, is the website itself procedurally generated? That's my eventual goal. Once I get tired of doing the blog, I'm going to have it procedurally generate the rest of the entries for... Ever after, just have like a Google, Google crawler that finds relevant stuff. I like that. That's mm, fantastic. Now, we, the reason we're mentioning this is because that's actually our topic for the day. That it is so. uh, procedural generation in games. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, kind of the difference be- differences between um, procedurally generated content versus procedurally generated narratives. Um, obviously on the podcast here and Doc and I tend to be more interested in the narrative, so we might sort of lean that way. Um, but procedural generation in general has kind of been a uh, holy grail that people have been trying to achieve in gaming for a while, because as soon as we can do it, you can have these massive games, hypothetically, with very little effort. Of course, getting them to actually generate takes a ton of effort, Herculean efforts, one might say. Um, but Isaac and Alex have definitely been, um, at least in my experience, some of the most knowledgeable people in this area that I've come across. Uh, so we're definitely glad to have them on to talk about that. For sure. But before we get to that, we're going to go in and get into our opening segments, including the button mosh. Ready for the butt mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So what have you guys been playing recently? Witness? Uh, me too. Okay, now... Can I get a witness? Um, the, the, the real question is, how much of this are we going to talk about? Because there's, a, there's an irony here. Um, the Witness is sort of, by design, a game that you're intended to be launched into knowing kind of nothing and it's an explorer's dream by that i mean the explorer game type yeah i before i played the witness i I knew someone who played the earlier versions when it was in development and what he told me was like he's not going to tell me anything about the game other than kind of the 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 game is about coming to epiphanies yes which yes it is i thought was a very astute (laughs) way of talking about it I like it. Well, so I guess we should give our spoiler alert. You know, we're, we're not much on spoilers here on the podcast. We tend to spoil all kinds of things all, all the time. 
Um, but in this particular case, it, e even talking about the things that we would normally not do a spoiler for, it feels like we should do a spoiler alert for for the witness. Um, for for example, one of the things that you'll do is encounter game elements. We'll call them puzzle elements. So there are puzzles in the game. And as you walk up to it, it's kind of an unsolvable puzzle. If you try to brute force the thing, it's going to have thousands and thousands of permutations. And then you walk down the path a little bit, and you discover a thing that literally teaches you how to solve that puzzle that you just passed. This is brilliant. I, I call for more games of this design. Um, this alone was enough to just have me completely short circuit all the Mad Max that I've been playing <laughs> and uh, just focus on the witness for the last three days, almost solid. Wow. I think I went to bed at four o'clock last night, <laughs> um, which was not good because, uh, you know, the kid had uh, gym mm. in the next day. But <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's unlike any other game that I've had, but it reminds me the most of Myst. Mm -hmm. I'll concur with that. That has a very um, mist-like feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, a project that I actually worked on with Isaac and a, another friend of ours, Sean, in grad school, um, when it came time to put a genre onto it, we called it a mist em up uh, <laughs> oh, That's great. <laughs> because it has an island, it has puzzles that you have to solve in the world that then affect the world. And The Witness basically has both of those things. Yeah, it does. And and that's kind of, it's, the more, the reason I hesitate to agree that the game it reminds me most of is Mist, mm -hmm. is because the Mist had a heavy and explicit narrative and thematic uh, thread running through. Yeah, it had a backstory and an endgame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Are you, and are you unwilling to commit to that statement for the witness at this time? Definitely not the direct. Right. Yeah. I myself, I've not 100% of the game. I've gotten, I think, further than anyone else sitting at this table. But there's definitely some stuff there, but it's very indirect. You have to piece it yourself together yourself. Um. But it, I, I don't think it's on the same order that Mist was a, a, a puzzle game with a narrative focus. Right. This is a puzzle game with a psychological component, mm. sort of. Yeah, I like that. It's it's almost nonfiction mm -hmm. rather than it's more of an essay than it is a story. Huh. That's kind of true. Yeah. I'm not because I'm only like 75% of the way maybe through it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure where the overall theme mm -hmm. is going because there seems to be a tension between the logical side and the more philosophical mm -hmm. side it seems mm -hmm. to be trying to invoke. You're close to the first ending. Okay, close to the first ending-ish. <laughs> I tell you, I, the, the most profound thing for me is I'm sitting here yesterday and... Um, and I realized that I have stared at the same screen without moving for probably 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I have taken pictures of my television. I have a clipboard with little drawings that look like hieroglyphics. <laughs> um, and, and I have done more meta in what is terribly incorrect to call a video game, uh, but absolutely is a video game, than any game that I've done in a very, very long time. And that it succeeds incredibly well. Yeah, I I had one yeah. puzzle where the TV was off, mm -hmm. and I was trying to work it out on graph paper. Right. <laughs> and that is something that hasn't happened in video games no, for, for a very long while. time. Yeah, and yeah. it was probably a dungeon crawl when it did, right? Yeah, I, I know for sure the last for me was a dungeon crawl, and it was less of a this is interesting and more of a this is a chore. Mm -hmm. Right. The stuff in Witness. When it forces me to do this, it's exciting, it's yes. engaging, it's interesting. Huh. Well, except for that one puzzle. You it's going to be different for everybody, but everybody's going to run into that, that, one, oh, puzzle. that <laughs> one puzzle. Yeah. That one puzzle. Ugh. That's true. The whole I, game I was do, great, but that one puzzle. I do have, a, I do have a, that one puzzle. Mm. That's true. It's, it's part of the experience, though. You gotta. It's a it's rite of passage. You have to do the one puzzle. So what else have we been playing? Uh, recently, I just beat Firewatch. 
Okay, now, I may have to leave the room because I just <laughs> bought Firewatch. Yeah. And, and I really want to know, and I really also don't want to know because I want to play it. It looks yeah. amazing to me. Then my, my spoiler-free review of Firewatch is... Well, the short version is play it. It's worth it. <laughs> the long version is I don't think I've played a game that reads more like a short novel. Hmm. Really? Or the the, the 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 plays like I, I would think of it as a short novel. Now, do you, by that, do you mean it's linear? Uh oddly, I'd say having only played it once, I can't know for sure. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, a lot of people complain about how linear something was when they played it once. My my guess is that if I were go back through and play it again. It would have a lot of nonlinear elements that were minor atop a linear skeleton. Is well, in other words, bottlenecks. Yeah, the sort of. But 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 when I say that, I I don't just mean it's like a short novel. I mean it is through and through a video game in a way that other things that would be similar to that classification mm-hmm. would be more similar to being a short novel, just in video game input. I see. I would actually compare it a little bit more to a radio play. Hmm. And partially that's because of the basic um, dialogue structure that you've got. Well, you, you've got it. somebody on a radio who's yes. talking to yes. you. Yes, so yes. There's a, the, literally the radio-based pun is not lost on this audience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, just the way the writing's structured, it seems to be very heavily um, drawing from that field Trying to create imagery through just words. Absolutely. Spoken words. Yeah. Well, sense. you're you're also walking um, in what's basically an open world, mm-hmm. not a huge one, because uh, they compress it smaller than the actual wilderness would well, be. Yeah. So you're not wandering for days. <laughs> but um, that's why I hesit- one of the reasons why I hesitate to call it totally linear is because, well, there is a closed progression path that takes you through to the end, and I don't know yet how many branches or whatever are in that. Well, it seems to be in a forest, so lots. <laughs> I'm, oh. I'm face pumping. Yeah. You can't see it, pitch. but I'm face pumping. I'm impressed none of us let out an audible groan. No. <laughs> I'm actually impressed, too. The uh, look, though, just screamed in, groan. Insert so. a stick joke next, or maybe a pine cone. <laughs> <laughs> Proceeding. Sorry. Um... I lost the trail of what I was going to say. <laughs> ah, trails. Trails, yeah. <laughs> but, um... Well, so, pack it up. He can't see the forest for the trees because of the... Uh... Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> because the forest is on fire. Right. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Not if you've done your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, that actually but, begs a really important question. But you're question. not sure how much branching there is. Um... Not sure how much... Because, like you said... Only playing through it once, uh-huh. it's really hard to tell. Um, but the base below that is an open world environment. That's great. Well, I want to come back to this because in our main topic, I, I want to pose the question: Would the game have worked if the if the forest fire could be prevented, for example? Um, and, and and I don't know. I haven't played it. I'm speaking out of ignorance, but mm-hmm. uh, I, w- I want to stick that that question in our hats and come back to it. What what else have we been playing? Uh, the game that I played before Firewatch, uh, well, that was lots of XCOM 2, but the narrative <laughs> game I played before Firewatch that's actually felt very similar to Firewatch is Oxenfree, hmm. which just came out in the, uh, January. Yeah, I've been looking forward to that one, actually. That's one of the ones that, one of my top ten for the year, and I didn't realize it was out. What's it out on? Uh, it's out on PC because I played it on PC. So Steam. Yeah, uh, I want to say it's out on something else, but I'd have to look it up. Okay, well, I don't think it's on any of the Playstations because I, I think I would have caught it, which disappoints me greatly. Yeah, I want to say it's coming out for the PlayStation, but I won't swear to it. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna have to look that one up. 
I'm actually curious, like, what did you think of it overall? Because I watched um, the opening demo for it, and granted, they only tease what seems to be, like, the core of the story in that. Yeah. Um, they have, like, the beach party. And actually, I was interested, Doc, you said that I might be interested in because of the narrative presentation, yeah. the way that you kind of do the dialogue options while moving around and that yeah, sort of thing. If you're, yeah, if you're approximately close to someone, mm-hmm. you have conversation, it sort of, it feels like an emerging conversation with them. Is that, is that correct? Uh, that's pretty close. Okay. It's... There are there are instances where you initiate the conversation, but sure. uh, it's a very fluid, con- one of the most fluid conversation systems I've seen. And does that carry through? Like yes. I said, we've only seen the first 12 yeah, minutes. So. That's basically the core of the entire game is the conversations you have mm-hmm. with the other characters. Gotcha. Um, it's... A little bit of the telltale, you've got three choices mm-hmm. kind of thing, and it's. But here it's much more real time, mm-hmm. and it's structured more like an actual conversation where people will interrupt mm-hmm. each other. Right. Um, you can choose not to say something, and that's mm-hmm. actually a really significant, and there's a Steam achievement if you say nothing for the entire game. Oh, nice. Um, but the core of the game is those conversations. Mm-hmm. Because the, the premise, I'll say, from that demo didn't grab me. It was more kind of like an interesting, um, an interesting like kind of experiential thing. And then they had the thing where they open up the little portal and they start talking to the person through the radio. Um, and then obviously that's kind of like the mystery that's going to be driving the rest of the game. But I don't know, just to me, it just didn't really strike me as like, oh, man, this is a story I got to get into. So I'm just curious if you thought it was good just overall. Um, I think the story has a fairly meaty mystery to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's more of a horror, um, thriller type story. Okay. Um, but kind of on top of that is the relationships between the characters. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I feel, where the heart of the game is. Okay. Hmm. Actually, that does intrigue me, the idea that you can... I assume that through your choices, you can affect how different characters will end up. Yeah, and at the end of the game, there'll be a little um, Telltale-style breakdown of what other players chose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Cool. I'll tell you what it looks like to me. mm -hmm. It looks like an adventure game. Uh, Monkey Island-style, kind of almost almost three-quarter view, but not really. Um, You're coming at, you know, from the side. It's profiled. But I assume it doesn't have any of those kinds of mechanics to it, or maybe it does. It doesn't have the inventory puzzles. Okay. It does have some interaction with the radio. Mm-hmm. That if you're going to look for like deep witness style puzzle stuff, mm-hmm. look somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a few different um, things you have to figure out. Mm-hmm. But by and large, I'd compare it to something closer to Kentucky Route Zero, right? Where you're going through the experience, and there's not necessarily a wrong answer most of the time. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, there are there's a literal pop quiz at one point. <laughs> <laughs> but just so you know, everything on in the game will be on the test. You were telling me before the show that Oxenfree has an alternate reality game. Yes, I didn't know anything about this. Hidden in the game, there are clues pointing to a larger puzzle outside the game. Wow. Hmm. Um, So far, and I've been involved in starting to figure it out, Mm -hmm. so far we've found a phone number to call that's been giving us various messages. Mm -hmm. I haven't checked back in this week, but people were starting to piece together what this all was pointing towards. Hmm. Cool. Good stuff. It's especially interesting because at the end of the game, and I've played it two and a half times at this point mm-hmm. and watched other people play it, at the end of the game, there's still a couple of unresolved questions, mm. and I'm wondering how that's going to tie into the other things that they're doing with kind of the larger franchise. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Fascinating. Have they already talked about whether they're going to do um, a sequel or anything like that? Or They've actually talked about making a film. Okay. Hmm. And possibly comic books, but I haven't seen like any details of that. Just mm-hmm. They were talking about that a few months ago. Gotcha. Because I was going to say, if like sort of the final solve, so to speak, is somewhere in the ARG, you're kind of counting on people going to a very niche sort yeah, that's of dangerous. media that's very dangerous. to get the final answer to 
the game that's the mainstream product. And I think that's why some people are having a bit of a reaction to the ending. Mm-hmm. Because at the very, very end of the game, there's something that deliberately leaves it unresolved. Hmm. And that's left a little bit of a sour taste in some people's mm-hmm. minds. But, but is it like a last scene in Inception unresolved? Or? Kind of, yes. Okay. Uh, Inception mm. is a good comparison. <laughs> See, I have no problems with that. Yeah. I, I really don't. I, I think no. that some of the best um, stories are kind of that way. That, that yeah. implies that there could be more story. If you're, if you're fine with a little bit of ambiguity in your story and you're not looking for the answer that will resolve everything... Mm-hmm then I think it's a perfectly satisfying ending. Nice. If you're expecting to save the world, it's not going to happen. Well, welcome to postmodern video gaming. <laughs> it's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. So, uh, about a year ago, a co-worker of mine got me hooked on League of Legends. And... Do I kept need, up with need it. Need to have an intervention? Or? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Um, Let's see. <laughs> I can quit anytime I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But, but so 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 last year I I basically I learned to play. I got to the point where I thought I wasn't trash, uh, and I did ranked, and I was okay in ranked. I I know I could go higher if I wanted to. Well, they just switched over ranked seasons. And for some reason, in this current season of ranked play, I've just had all sorts of problems I did not have last season. And so I'm in a match, playing ranked, where I expect, and this is probably my mistake, I expect people to have a clue what they're doing. (laughs) And it turns out, um, that's a really bad assumption in just about any field (laughs) <laughs> that a random stranger forced to cooperate with you will have any clue what they're doing. Mm. It's just, if you don't directly observe them understanding it, it's not going to work out well. No, we all know the solution is just to scream at them and tell them what to do. Well, of course. <laughs> um, and that's why I don't play League of Legends. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so the person's playing a character called Gangplank. And Gangplank is a pirate. The important things to know about him is that uh, his ultimate ability, his big showy ability, can be used anywhere on the board. It rains cannonballs down in a, in a, inside of a circle, you know, doing a lot of damage to things inside of it. And it's basically available every minute and a half or so, every two minutes. So uh, we have an opponent who's putting a lot of pressure on the top side of our base. And I go over... And I stop them from doing it, which is the right thing. But this person playing Gangplank keeps keeps warning me via the pings, like, hey, don't do this. Hey, don't do this. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, it's like, well, if I run away, he's going to destroy our top, the top of our base. So I have to stay there. And there's this large wave of minions pushing into our base. Minions are, you know, the, the things in the lane that essentially they're there to take up tower aggro and put pressure into one of the three lanes on the map. Uh... They're also worth gold when you kill them. So he's pinging me off, and I start to realize, oh, he's pinging me off because he really wants to get the gold from all these minions. Well, just to put things in perspective, this entire match, this gangplank has been useless. <laughs> he's been getting killed pretty much any time he goes into lane, and he's aggressively trying to kill the other person even when he's way behind. So he needs the gold, but it's also not worth it for him to get the gold because <laughs> he's so far behind it doesn't matter. But he's a pirate, I mean, it's instinct. <laughs> That is true. <laughs> so the second he respawns, he uses his ultimate, which is only up every two minutes, on the minion wave that I'm in the middle of <laughs> killing, so that he gets the gold instead of me. Wow. That's fine. That's passive-aggressive. That's annoying. 30 seconds later, we're in a 5 versus 5 fight. Sorry, did I say 5 versus 5? 4 versus 5, because game <laughs> point is top farming. <laughs> And we're more or less, it's like, we know we have the power here. We can win. We can go use this to win the game. But it turns on us. And at that point, someone in chat yells, Gangplank, use your ult. But they didn't know. (laughs) They didn't know. Gangplank had already used his ult. 
to farm minions. <laughs> we lose the fight, and then Gangplank decides to run in and try and 1v3 the survivors. Gets blown up, the game's over. That is not unheard of in this game, for this to happen. But this type of thing has been happening regularly mm -hmm. since the new season started, and I can't explain it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to throw up your hands and go, well, of course I lost another game. I had this teammate who was playing horribly. But you would imagine that you would, over time, get an even distribution. <laughs> and it just doesn't seem to happen that way. Well, so it makes me wonder if they switched their algorithm. They totally switched their algorithm. Why the algorithm is putting more bad players on my team than the other team? <laughs> is what I can't figure out. So... In that sense, I've totally gotten wrecked. <laughs> nice. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Well, this time I'd actually like to talk about a game called Roll for the Galaxy. Um, you may have heard of the card game. I know that uh, some of us at the table have played it. Race for the uh, Galaxy. One Race for the favorites. Galaxy, yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of a love it or hate it game, I think. Um, People hate it? Some do. Some of them can't read the cards because oh, well. they're incomprehensible icons. Of course, I learned to play it with Richard Worth. <laughs> oh, well, <yes>. so, <laughs> you know. so you've never tasted victory. <laughs> never. <laughs> never once have I won. <laughs> uh, but actually, Roll for the Galaxy is um, it, its kind of neat in the sense that it introduces a little bit of randomness into it. Um, some people will hate that and some people will love it, so it's probably another love it or hate it game. But really, it's a resource management game. Or... I should say, a dice management game. And dice management games have been pretty popular of, of late. Um, I know that, uh, you know, like the the hero game, the, the superhero game that, that came out that had the cards uh, and, the, and the dice, I forget what it's called. Um, that, that was one of them. Sentinels of the Multiverse? Mm, that may have been one of the expansions. Um, but anyway... Uh, the, the idea is that you roll your dice, and they are your workers. And the workers, because they are humans, are saying, this is what I would prefer to do. Now, there are die color types that come with it, too. The red ones are military. Uh, the green ones are, like, alien technology. The purple ones are uh, they're basically wild cards of sorts. And, and so what you've got is they'll come up, and they'll, they'll have a little rocket icon. And it'll say, uh, I want to deliver. I want to be a shipper. Because that's my calling in life, is to be a shipper. And you can dictate by sacrificing a, another die and force them to do whatever you want. Uh, and there are other special abilities that can kind of change it so that they can do other things. Uh, but the real strategy is trying to figure out how to get your dice to do what it is you want them to do instead of what they want to do. Hmm. But it's not, it's not terrible and it's not broken. There's never an opportunity not to do anything, if you know what I mean. Uh, you never go, ah, I just had a bad roll and I'm done. You can have a bad roll, but you're not done. If you're doing it right, you can actually make that work for you and invest in the next turn, which it won't matter what you roll, because you can then spend the, the capital that you did from before. All that is to say that you've got uh, your cup, you've got your citizenry, and you've got your tableau. And out on your tableau, you're trying to explore worlds. And this is where it feels very much like Rays for the Galaxy, in that you've got these little cards that you're trying to put out, and uh, they're double-sided, which is really cool because they're they're square cardboard, mm -hmm. uh, you know, heavy cardboard. They're not like uh, thin cards, when I say cards. But what you're trying to do then is decide the balance between I'm going to explore this world uh, and turn it into sort of an industrialization that will produce a special ability for me. Or on the flip side of it, I will um, actually gain another die from it. And so as you go... Along, you have to kind of maintain that balance between I want more dice and I want to be able to use my dice effectively. Hmm. And so that's the one thing that it has that Race of the Galaxy doesn't have that I think is really powerful. It's also a little quicker, in my opinion. and uh, Easier we, to get into. Yeah, it's, it's a lot easier to get into. You can basically show the little diagram and say, these are the five things that are happening. They're going to only happen if someone chooses to do it at the table. This is what those five things, each of them mean. Let's go. Cool. And you're good. So, uh, highly recommended. Um, got it for my birthday. Was not even expecting it. And uh, a friend gave it to me, and boom. Um, we have played, gosh, dozens of times. It has topped out as one of my favorite games, just straight to the top. So, roll for the galaxy. Check it out. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion.
I guess the first thing we should probably do is define what we mean by like procedural as a term as it relates to games, which you guys mentioned in the in the show prep that that might be an hour long discussion by itself. Um, so it's a good start. Yeah, let's let's try more briefly than an hour to try to define quickly what it is we're going to be talking. Well, about. Well, I've been using uh, Michael Cook's definition that he came up for Proc Jam, which is make something that makes something. Mm. So oh, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Simple enough. Well, it was a nice conversation. Yeah. No, that, that's actually that's an incredible way to put it. It's both specifically capturing the what, what, what at least the aims of procedural are without bogging down in too much detail. And well, this is technically not part of it because of X, even though we should really be studied under the same banner. So I I, I like make something that makes something. It's a good way to think um, about it. But at least in terms of its application to games, we can get more specific and, and come up with a couple of interesting subcategories to that. So there's, under the general header of procedural content, I mean, so you, ha- you can have things like what Michael Cook is working on, where he's working on teaching a computer to make games Starting from the game design. Hmm. Uh, there's actually been every... Um, I don't know if he's done it for this last Ludum Dare, but for the past few Ludum Dares, he's had the Angelina generator hmm. create a uh, totally generated game. Wow. Angelina on, is the name of his thesis project? Or yeah. has he graduated? He I graduated saw that video. Now. Um you know, the sort of the release of that. Yeah. And it fooled people into thinking that it was a real person. Am I thinking of the right thing? Um, it was, uh, it, was it, was it actually like a, a, a CG robot no. named Angelina? No. Okay. I'm so thinking you were thinking totally about something totally different. Okay. Angelina is his ongoing project to basically create an automatic game designer. Okay. And like I said, he's, entered it in the past couple of Ludum Dares mm. where he's done one that's explicitly made by Angelina and then he's done another one as a control mm-hmm. that he doesn't reveal until all the voting's over. Okay. So he's been using that as a way to gauge how effective it's been. Mm-hmm. And they tend to follow the theme as closely as some other Ludum Dare games I've seen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where do we start with this? We were making the distinction between right. the high level contents of like yeah, generate an entire game from scratch. Yeah, and the, 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 you, you can go to that level. You can also just use. So a big chunk of it is I've I've stopped using the word procedural as much, and I now I use generative. Okay. Um, oh really? For arcane technical reasons. Mm. Um, but ge- generative systems, uh, and largely that's just because there's baggage in the current discourse over procedural that. There just isn't right now with generative systems. Uh, notably, I can do work on a generative system and apply it to more than just games. So I could create a generative system for creating a tree, and that would be as, as applicable in any environment it would work in, where you say procedurally generate a tree. And that also fits the same, but it's kind of people more make assumptions. Um, so there have been a few people who've had more nuanced reasons for switching to generative over procedural, And I think largely because they switched, I decided, yeah, that sounds fine. And so now I use the word generative a lot. So if I start talking generative systems, I mean procedural. Okay. Um, But but you you, you could do something as small as, you know, a a common technique in AAA games these days, which even ones that are heavily, you know, thoroughly micro-designed, they use procedural content for things like um, textures. Mm -hmm. So they, they will have a system with an understanding of what a material is, actually do the, the texture generation either offline or at runtime uh, for the game. So even this incredibly static content is in itself involving a generative system. So, I, I mean, it runs the gamut from everything is generative to just the tiniest detail is generative. So there's, there, there's a huge scope, and I, I think what a lot of people say when they say, oh, this game has procedural content in it, is less about more the, 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 the low-level you know, textures, trees, buildings, and more the space 
at which the player plays the game right. or comprehends the game. Even if there are small details lower down that influence how the player reacts to something or how the player feels about something, that's not the level at which they are consciously interpreting the game world. So mm-hmm. can you give us an example out of some games we might have played? Of? Of procedurally generated content okay. in the ways that you're talking about. So um, Spelunky has procedurally generated content in that it generates every playthrough a unique level and ch- an array of obstacles. Now, the formulas it does for this are actually rather well-known, and the, the content that it populates the level with, either block types or enemy types or chunks of blocks, are all well-known and understood and static. But because the combinations you encounter them in are different every time, either by the, the passability or, you know, this thing only shows up one in 20 levels or, you know, oh, there's one of that enemies found in every level, but on this level, for some reason, there's three of them and they're all in the same room. And mm-hmm. the different ways it then forces you to approach the content greatly impact the play experience and mean that the game is interesting for far more than a single playthrough. Mm-hmm. Like it would likely be um, short of individually challenging yourself in other ways if it was all a static content and it was just a hundred pre-designed levels. I think roguelikes are probably the most prominent example right now of content that is procedurally generated in some way. The fact that each playthrough is slightly different, even though it's got a lot of the same core, kind of like what you're well, saying. That's the it's definition warranty. of a roguelike, right? Yeah. The original game Rogue yeah. was all about procedural generation, and that's why yeah. they're called roguelikes. I, I, I will also say, in the roguelike community, there's been a term that has been created that I love um, to talk about not just roguelikes that take specifically after Rogue, but at the point you got to broader ones like FTL that have roguelike elements but are not themselves modeled after Rogue. Great game. So so, um, so, so the, the, the delay term for that for a while has been roguelike-like mm. or you know, mockingly, uh, I know I and other people have called them rogue loves. Because, I mean, if you like like someone, you just really need to say the word. <laughs> 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 nice. um, but, but the term that was created that I like because it's more specific, having gone through an academic background of some degree... <laughs> I admire that way. It's procedural <laughs> death labyrinth. I like it. Excellent. It's, procedur- <laughs> it, 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 it's procedurally generated so that the actual content you encounter is different every time you play through it. it the death um, that it has permadeath that is of some degree of importance that forces you to restart once you've hit the fail condition. And whether that's a true restart or a partial restart, less interesting in of itself but it has some component where permadeath is used in an interesting way. And uh, a labyrinth, because the more classic mainstream uh, concept of the roguelike is very much about the dungeon dive. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have a dungeon of some sort. So now, does FTL count as having a dungeon? FTL does not. So it does not actually count as a true-blooded procedural death labyrinth unless you want to define labyrinth to include FTL's uh, star maps. In which case, yeah, it does. Sure, go ahead. Okay. I, I would call it maybe the um, procedural death odyssey. Nice. <laughs> also be an amazing band name, procedural death odyssey. Procedural death odyssey. Well, that and labyrinth, actually. Labyrinth? Mm. That's probably taken. Might be. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> okay, so when we talk about something like Minecraft, mm-hmm. which has no story to speak of, but is allegedly a world that's like eight times the size of actual Earth or something. Technically can go on further. It, it could, yeah. but I mean, not under current architecture. Right. Architecture. And that, that's not really my point. But mm-hmm. uh, we talk about that, which is an old game now. Um, and then look at um, No Man's Sky, which is coming up. Mm-hmm. Okay, And they hit the, the Create Universe button. And, and this is my new thing. I'm talking about the Create Universe button. Because this is a big mm-hmm. deal. If we can hit the Create Universe button and, and there's really 15 quintillion worlds out there. But how truly procedurally generated is that? In other words, we've got blocks mm-hmm. in Minecraft. And they're one meter by one meter. And that's pretty much our resolution, right? Mm-hmm. What's the resolution of No Man's Sky in the sense of the 15 quintillion worlds? So, so here's where I get to use computer science term. Yeah. Sparse. Minecraft, since 2011, has been sparse itself, mm-hmm. and No Man's Sky is almost absolutely sparse. And what sparse means is that the mathematical possibilities for 15 quintillion worlds exist, 
but until someone goes to visit, it's not actually calculated. Right. So the data will be generated based upon the algorithm from the seed value. Mm -hmm. uh, and Minecraft is actually a bit more complex, mm -hmm. I believe, because it also takes into account the generation of its neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but for No Man's Sky especially, it exists as a mathematical abstract until someone goes to see it, and only then does it actually make the data. So it truly has 15 quintillion worlds, they're just unrealized until they're visited. Right. Well, there's also the other aspect of it, of how effective or dense that generation is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not just the technical parameters of the generation, but how much of that content you'll experience as interesting new content. Right. Yes. In, well, in Minecraft terms, it's biomes. I, I would say that a biome is its own world or planet. In, in the same context that in No Man's Sky, you would go to a new planet. You're going to a new area. And that is a discrete area with its own kind of interesting stuff. Now, I, I played a lot of Minecraft. And I've been to a lot of different biomes that were, like, really amazing and cool. And, wow, look at this thing. And look at, look at how this came about. And look at the way this generated. What I'm really saying is exactly what Isaac just said, which is how, how long is it going to take for us to get bored flying around in our spaceship and landing on a new world that has all the same elements just in a different order? So for several years now, when I talk about procedural content, this is precisely what I talk about the effectiveness of any generative content system is it's not in how many things you can create. Because that's you know pretty simple math and it comes to some incomprehensibly large number. Mm -hmm. But how many times can an average player play through it and still see things that surprise or or wonder them. You know, it, it, at some point they've played through it enough, they've seen everything, the next iteration to them is not any different than the 20th iteration back. Right. And as a... So, so, so when, I, when I try to rate the efficacy of a, of a generative content system, I, I do it a lot less in terms of how many can it make. It's a lot more how long before I get bored of the content it generates. There's actually been some research into this. Uh, Jillian Smith and Jim Whitehead came up with something called expressive range analysis. Okay. Which basically breaks down how expressive and non-boring <laughs> any given generator is going to be. That's wonderful. So it's a, an actual metric. Yes. That's fantastic. So if we were to take a game like... Um, pardon the pun, Binding of Isaac. Mm -hmm. And then, then could we add, cr like actually create that metric on, on, its, on its level of boringness? Michael Cook's actually working on a tool in Unity to automatically rate generative algorithms. Mm -hmm. And so if you feed the numbers in, you should be able to get a general idea. You'd have to know exactly how the generator worked, of course. Of course. Well, and, and, and the, the big tough design question to that is, for this generator, you have to create um, some kind of metric or analytical method that figures out how different it is compared to another. Okay, so this is bringing me to a really interesting headspace. Let's say that we've created a generator that creates generators. Mm-hmm. Okay, which I think is where we're going with all this, right? I mean, obviously, that's our, our end goal here, is not just to create a generator that creates an, a new, exciting Minecraft, but something that creates Minecrafts, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, or, or No Man's Skies, or Binding of Isaacs, or insert game here. Mm -hmm. And we feed in enough information into this um, evaluator, this mm -hmm. generator evaluator, so that at some point we can then derive a generator based on the data from the evaluator, which gives us not just a, a, a really robust one, mm -hmm. but an actually really interesting one in human terms. Mm -hmm. Something that, that mathematically or mechanically should appeal to our philosophical desire to have new content handed to us. Did that make sense? Did I did I say that right? I think it, in a way, sort of segues into you know something I'd like to talk a little bit more about, which is procedural narrative generation. Um, the idea that we've been able to find interesting ways, I think, to generate content within games, even if it's not the entire game itself. There's an element of the game that we keep making so that it's not exactly the same every time. Right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Big example. 
But then, is there some way that we can have games that have a different narrative every time? Because I think after a little while, you know, even if you're exploring like a slightly different uh, thing, like we have basically we had the same problem with No Man's Sky with Minecraft. Once you've seen a biome, there's not that much different between the just being like, okay, now there are two mountains here instead of one. Or Your something surprise like level goes down each time. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and narratively, obviously, we'd have a game that, if it was procedurally generated, has probably a certain range, at least given our current technology, but having it be that you have a different story each time and a different sort of, I don't know, maybe even moral each time. The fact that you get something different out of it each time you play. Well, come on, right now we humans are in charge of Hollywood and we can't even come up with anything original, so... <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we have yet... There are people who are trying, but we have yet to teach a computer to feel, mm-hmm. so... Well, that's a very good point. Um, I, and I would look at it another way, too, is there's no win for losing. Because if you make two things that are almost identical or similar, let's let's just use um, Star Wars and Harry Potter. Okay, mm-hmm. So episodes, episode four and Harry Potter one, um, they're basically the same story. You've got this orphan who uh, discovers he has magical powers and then goes to learn about it. And in so doing, encounters the Dark Lord and defeats him. I mean, that's... It's the hero's journey. Yeah, it probably won't be too hard to do a hero's journey generator or some right. sort. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying, mm-hmm. is you do that, and it's like, oh, you're just doing hero's journey. You don't do that, and it's like, oh, that story doesn't resonate with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't win for losing. So so a lot of the existing research in that field has been under this this sort of premise. Um, it, it's actually been a lot less focused on the hero's journey and a lot more on um, classical fairy tales, more, sure. more so a descendant of props morphology than it is on Campbell's Hero's Journey. Yeah, yeah. actually, that makes a lot more sense. Cool. Um, and, and I think that's because the problem with the Hero's Journey is it leans towards very similar, compelling, but similar stories, and you have to find other ways outside of what the core narrative arc is to make the content interesting compared to the last iteration. Mm-hmm. Whereas with a fairy tale, you can pull from a shared common set of... Uh, symbols you know the witch the raven the wolf mm-hmm. and arrange them in different ways and come up with different a broader diversity of stories out of a similar set of content and just given the nature of uh, you know production time it, it's you have to create the content and the algorithm and the static content in either case is going to be your pretty much your art assets as well as you know if you have any your core gameplay or if it's text, you know, your 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 concept to text engine. This might actually play a little bit into something else that I know you guys have played and I've tried out. Um was it a uh, prom week? I think yes. I'm almost picturing now kind of a almost a social simulator where you take these different archetypal characters and sort of say if we put them in these sort of situations, here's what the outcome's gonna be. And you're trying on. to date them. <laughs> that too. And no, no wait, that's been done. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> or befriend them. Or befriend them. Because prom, uh, prom week, you do try and ask the girl you want out to prom based upon the mission it gives you at the start of the game. You have to figure out how to to engineer that, which comes off way less callous than it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, what was interesting to me about um, prom week is that I got into it because it was, oh, okay, a procedural story, uh, social simulation, that sounds all really interesting. What it sort of turned into for me, at least as far as the way they tried to execute that as a game, seemed almost like a puzzler. Mm-hmm. They give you an objective. They say, make so-and-so break up with so-and-so by the end of the week or something like that. Mm-hmm. And each time it's a different challenge. And so you're in a way you're kind of just gamifying social life in high school. Um, you mean high school? <laughs> that too. Yeah, that's, that's how I survived high school. I don't yeah. know about you guys. But. I just did my homework. So. <laughs> Again, extracurricular. I was going for the, uh, for the grade, right? Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> how I ever passed algebra, I will never know. Mm-hmm. Um. But in that sense, so, though, it almost turns more into emergent story than a procedural and, narrative. And, and there's, and this is not too strict camps, but it's sort of there's two methodologies, mm-hmm. and everyone who does anything interesting borrows from both. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, you're more top down. We generate these story beats first, and then we figure out how to get the player to play through them. Mm-hmm. And then there's your more bottom up. We have this systemic simulation, which is incredibly tough to actually create. I think Prom Week has, you know, thousands and thousands of social dynamic rules. Mm-hmm. They built a social physics engine, is what they call it. <laughs> nice. And then by creating a certain original orientation and giving you a certain objective, mm-hmm. 
than the act of exploring how to leverage the social physics engine to achieve your goal winds up tell, winds up you tell yourself the story as the result. I'm pretty sure that's what God did. He just didn't embed it in us a social physics engine and hit hit the go button. DNA? Yeah, and then randomly <laughs> no. uh, just randomly see, generated see fifteen quintillion worlds and you know, <laughs> one of them happened to have us, so but speaking of uh social simulations mm. that's actually the one emergent part of Oxenfree uh-huh. is the relationships between the different characters are not just a branching system, but there's a more emergent system mm-hmm. underneath that I wish they would release more details about. Mm. It, it takes a lot of guts to go that route because it's kind of an unbound development time thing. So when you're talking about actually making it as a game, um, it's way safer to not do that and do branching. Yeah. Because you can map the branches out. Even if you bottleneck, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and there's an irony, too, which is that as soon as you publish your work on, look, this is how we did this great thing, that everybody steals it. Mm. And it's no longer your thing. You can't market it. I mean, Blizzard has, has sat on their IP for, gosh, decades now with some of the algorithms they use for things, like how they track their MMOs and, and things like that. It's amazing. Their MMO metrics, they talk about the results but not the processes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but Blizzard talks about a lot what they do more on the art or design sides mm-hmm. in, That's true. in detail. Valve, though, gives away their secrets. Yes, it does. Um, like, what, one of the most cited GDC talks I think there is, is when Valve's talking about their director system. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, the, the one they did after that, uh, which I had the pleasure of getting to see live, which was them talking about how they adapted the director system for dialogue in Left 4 Dead 2. Hmm. And it's a brilliant, brilliant solution that is totally applicable and should be drug into all sorts of other stuff and has been since. Mm. The one that I really want to see talked about that's not talked about at all and I think might even be considered trade secret by EA is sports games, the announcing. Mm. Because the technology for that has improved leaps and bounds. I've noticed that. I don't play many sports games, but but I have noticed it. But no one talks about it. But speaking of sports games, Mm. actually one of the best examples of the emergent narrative comes out of management sports games. I agree mm. completely. Yeah. I mean, like, I've played a few career modes in different sports games, 2K, uh, basketball being a big one, NBA mm-hmm. 2K, mm-hmm. Um, but that has some really interesting emergent stories because the structure is whether or not you end up winning the season. You know, it's a very natural parallel to real sports. It's not just that. So given that my current side project is a fantasy hero management sim, mm-hmm. but I've... <laughs> I've played a lot of, of sports sims in the past. I played, you know, a bunch of football manager, uh, whenever I played Pro Eleven Soccer, mm-hmm. which in high school was like the old, the, the sports game I played, and I played a lot of it. It had a, a sort of management championship mode. And it's not just does your team win the season. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of low hanging fruit these games could do to spice that up a lot. In mm-hmm. fact, um there's an indie soccer game called I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, oh, New Star Soccer. Mm-hmm. That finally they had, they had a big popular release on on mobile. But before that, they, they were interesting in that you played a career where you were a single player, but you also, they didn't just simulate your in-game. They also simulated your out-of-game life. And so you had to go do stuff out of games based upon the temperament of your player, which would have different things, for instance... If you went out to party, which did really good for your social standing, you'd get very lo- very poor training results, and your form would go down because mm-hmm. you come to you, you. There's a chance you could come to work hungover, mm-hmm. and the coach would be mad. And, and so they they simulated more of that stuff. But you, you, there's low hanging fruit like that that you know things more like Football Manager could take. But the interesting narrative arcs to me in those, and the one I'm kind of banking on for my the side project I'm working on, is. That the act of finding a player who's incredibly anonymous, you know, young, training them up, bringing them up through the system into superstardom mm-hmm. is very interesting. And that's independent of your team. Right. It's, you know, f- finding that like, when you go to the, the forums and you read about it, a lot of people talk about how do I find the hidden gems? Because that is an interesting, compelling narrative arc. Mm-hmm. It gives you this um, this feeling, and I would use the Yiddish word, but I keep butchering it and picking the wrong one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but there's basically a word in Yiddish for 
the feeling of having been a part of somebody else's success, specifically like helping raise someone to do something, either, you know, raise them from a kid to graduate high school or raise them from being a junior employee to, to spreading their own wings, that particular joy. And it's hugely compelling. It's very underused in video games and management simulators deliver on it in spades. Hmm. And that, in my mind, is an example of a bottom-up storyline to go back to the conversation to conversations. Mm-hmm. Right, where you, where you build, makes so much sense. You build the system and you build the simulation and then just sort of see what comes out of it. Yes. Yeah. And I draw a parallel between not just top-down and bottom-up, mm-hmm. but also Jesper Ewell's distinction between open emergent systems mm-hmm. and closed progression systems. Right, right. And there's, I think there's a continuum between those two ends, but the kind of generation you're talking about is going to be different depending on where you are on that spectrum. So where would you put XCOM on that spectrum? I think like most games, XCOM 2 specifically, but all XCOMs in general, are composed of layers within layers. Mm-hmm. So... The top level is a board game-like, somewhat emergent system where you're doing the strategic choices. Mm -hmm. Inside that are the missions, which are highly emergent, Mm -hmm. but generally also have an overall progression structure to them, depending on what objective you have. Like, get the VIP out of jail, take them to the extraction point. Now, those maps are... Are very generated though, aren't they? The new ones, generated. yeah. That's one of the yeah. distinctions in XCOM Two versus XCOM One. Apparently, the team discussed doing it for XCOM One, but thought that they could do enough maps to compensate. Once they had players logging a thousand hours, they realized they had underestimated the <laughs> playtime of the game. <laughs> so this time, they specifically went in and put a lot of effort to make. All the maps procedurally generated. See, I didn't realize the first one wasn't. It is a great production expense to do procedural content where hand done content can suffice. Right. Unless you truly need thousands and thousands and thousands of a thing. That makes sense. Um, or, or there's some higher order goal. Like um, one of the SSX, the later SSX games procedurally generated a whole mountain because mm-hmm. they wanted realistic wear that wound up fitting the paths they'd already, the courses they'd already drawn. That's true. A lot of games, um, even older games did that they, they hit the procedure button once mm-hmm. and then sort of locked it in i know uh, i think it was morrowind was it was it morrowind that morrowind did actually did a big thing of hand placing i think it was daggerfall you're daggerfall is the yeah. one i'm thinking of yeah daggerfall because you, you had the bobblehead effect in some of these towns that the yeah. whole world ended up being like twice the size of actual england so they didn't actually go in and, and curate every single town or every single person a lot of that Small town content was mm-hmm. was procedurally generated, and so some of it ended up being kind of an oops moment, where they had bobblehead town and things like that, and those were fun discoveries for for players to post about, and they're, they're sort of legendary now. But um, you know, I, I wonder often how much of that is done that we just don't know about. Well, they'll hit the they'll hit the button a few times, and then like, oh, well, this one looks good. Let's let's build off of this map. There's actually a lot of middleware that does that, like Speed Tree, right. is based entirely around that idea. Mm-hmm. So you'd save a ton of time. Just you don't have to hand place every tree. You just tell it roughly where you want trees. Exactly. And the software understands the structure of a tree probably better than than you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unless you've got an artist who just specializes in trees. I don't know where we'd find one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who's done a lot of trees. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know any experts about trees in video games at this table. Oh, Do no, I? No, 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 I can't make one. <laughs> I can talk about them. Although I did, I did go to school with somebody whose final project was was a random tree generator. So there's <laughs> that. But um, no, I, you know, it brings me all back to kind of where we started, which is um, with the witness. Mm-hmm. You know, and on one sense, there's a procedural narrative there, in that there is no narrative there. Um, It is completely given over to the player to explore. Mm -hmm. And this is where I completely say it is an emergent narrative. Emergent narrative, Which is different from procedural because that implies that a system is trying to generate it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good point. And it's a human system that's trying to generate it. um, Humans don't count. 
<laughs> that's, there you go. Well, I draw a distinction. I think humans do count, so that's the main difference between us. Regardless, <laughs> I think it's specifically one of the six types of nonlinear narrative, which is ergodic mm-hmm. and, and highly explorative, which is where you give over that choice to the uh, the player. But is, is there something even less restrictive than ergodic? Not really. Okay. Um, as long as there are boundaries, it's going to be ergodic, and, okay. and there are boundaries. You can't leave the island yeah. unless you count the little boat. Um, but I mean, <laughs> it's a uh, you know, it, which, which brings me to an interesting point, because there was actually an element of the game, a whole call it section of the game, that I couldn't find, and I couldn't figure out how to get to, because I hadn't used the boat enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that was my, my frustrating <laughs> puzzle, and it was a total meta thing. It just had to do with you couldn't get there unless you took the boat, which was, yeah. was really interesting. Um, and, and plays into that element that I'm talking about, which is my own personal narrative as it regards that game, is going to be very different than either of you guys. In the order in which you did things, the sequence in which you did oh, things, and which the puzzle fr- was that one puzzle? Yes, the frustration that you had because you didn't have yes. the vocabulary to do it yet. Well, well, like earlier today, I was watching Isaac uh, do a puzzle, and this one had taken me like an hour. I had an entire page in a notebook mm-hmm. filled with notes and diagrams for how to solve. And this he just nailed it in three puzzle. seconds, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> jerk. And, and you know, I was like, "How did you do that?" And he just goes, "Oh, well, it's basic color theory." if we're talking about procedurally generated narrative one of the most exciting places i've seen that happen lately is a national novel generation month which happens every november same time as nanowrimo Mm -hmm. where a bunch of people get together and try and teach their computers to write a novel so N- NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, is in November, right. where you try and write a 50,000-word novel. NaNoWriMo is at the same time, and you try and teach a computer to write a 50,000-word novel. Now, you, you did that this year. I've done it every year it's happened. Okay. How uh, many years is that? Three years. This, this is, Last November was the third year. Okay. And this year, there were something like 112 finished novels, I want to say. Hmm. The quality has gone up dramatically every year. It's probably been one of the most explosive sets of advances in procedural or generative narrative. And now is there is there a contest? Is it unofficial? Is it's it unofficial. Or? There's no award per se. Okay. It's just the satisfaction of having finished. Um, one of the most successful ones this year was a piece of procedurally generated fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Arguably it all is. I mean, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I've got to quote the title because it's amazing, but the illustrious career, <clears throat> the illustrious, uh, no, sorry. Got to do the full title. Mm. A Time for Destiny, the illustrious <laughs> career of so- Serenity Starlight Warhammer O. James during her first three years in the Space Fighters. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. <laughs> well, the amazing thing is it's readable, mm. which is for considering the random Dadaist mark of chains we started with three years ago, this is an amazing amount of progress in that The, the, the first one, I think the more interesting novels were ones that played with procedurally generating interesting form, not so much interesting content. Hmm. So it'd be like reading 50,000 words of E.E. E. Cummings. Uh, I can't read <laughs> a whole chapter of E.E. E. Cummings. So. <laughs> well, one of the this year we had a discussion and one of the metrics some of the people were shooting for is how long do people read before they start skimming Mm -hmm. and so we're getting up to where we feel like it's a couple chapters Mm -hmm. which um considering that one of the things that sparked this whole thing was the recognition that we were getting pretty good doing Twitter bots that could, you know, tell jokes and so on. Mm-hmm. But anything longer than 140 characters, there wasn't really a venue for. So going to 50,000 words is a, you know, a big jump. Yeah, and I think is. we're I think we're making some actual progress here to actually writing readable things. That's amazing. It it really takes me back to the Turing test. You know, that classic: uh, Can you have a conversation with a computer and not know it's a computer? kind of thing it which is an interesting point because i've specifically moved towards a direction of explicitly acknowledging the computer's hand Mm -hmm. in the work because i think 
uh, especially like the framing for this fan fiction, I describe it to people as the computer's learning how to write. So similar to an adolescent's learning how to write by writing fan fiction mm -hmm. and spending a lot of time on the details they care about, like all the clothes, <laughs> the robot here has its own idiosyncrasies in a similar way to an adolescent learning how to write. That's actually mm -hmm. brilliant. I never would have thought of it that way, but that's a really good way of putting it. Well, I think... Actually, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> I, I genuinely have. Is that if we want true AI, we need to think of a computer as a baby and give it what it needs as a baby, not try to create this fully formed human mind that is uh, an adult. That, that, that's insane. Yeah, I think... Literally. <laughs> it would be insane. <laughs> So I think the context you put on the generator is a big part of how people are going to receive it. Mm -hmm. And so in my own work, I've favored doing stuff that's explicitly generative, that acknowledges that a computer had its hand in creating this. Mm -hmm. So when I did my novel for this past Nano Genmo, which was Virgil's Commonplace Book, it's explicitly a travel log across a map of the Roman Empire uh, where Virgil periodically stops and quotes some piece of Roman literature about the location where he's standing. Huh. That's really interesting. It's, I think the, re, uh, the real readability there comes in from all the historical references. Mm -hmm. And it is dense with them. Mm. <laughs> uh, because this was an actual structure for some Roman works of, they'd collect a bunch of quotations and put it in a commas place book. And in some cases, that's our only his surviving historical example of works that would otherwise be lost mm -hmm. because people basically copied it down, like putting your bookmarks in your browser. Yeah, that makes sense. And so this is kind of a, geographic arrangement of literature, which is something I'm really interested in, is we've got these great search engines, but search engines only tell you what you want to find, what you know you want to find. Mm -hmm. they, they can't give you what you don't know you want to find. That's true. Hmm. I like it. Um, and I'd be really remiss if I mentioned NanoGenmo and I didn't mention Emily Short's contribution, which was technically something she did in November. I mean, sorry, December, after it was over. But she created a collaborative work with her and the computer. And the second half of it is kind of an analysis of her approach to doing the writing. And I think for anyone trying to write anything interactive, especially anything that involves both interactivity and procedural generation. In a general sense, if that describes you and you don't know about Emily Short, go look up Emily Short. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd have to concur with this because she's one of the people who's been working in interactive fiction on like the forefront, mm -hmm. doing these amazing experiments. Her first um, big release was a game that was about having a conversation with an artificial intelligence. And it, every clever idea I've ever had, Emily Short had two years before I did and already <laughs> shipped the project. <laughs> uh, so this particular one from this past uh, December is, like mine, a travelogue, only she did a much better job of doing the writing. Mm. And like I said, she came up with this kind of aesthetic tarot as a kind of thematic organization hmm. that not only reflects like the content of the towns visited, but also how she approached the generation. So she divided it into salt, beeswax, venom, mushroom, and egg. And these were her, delicious. These were her five, <laughs> rather than like the classical fire, water, or so on elements, uh -huh. these were her five organizing uh, principles that she structured the generator around. So, for example, mushroom signifies the random fungus like uh, 
base level generation of all your little details. Sure, yeah. So Minecraft's got a lot of mushroom-like stuff in its landscape generation. Yes, it does. Including mushrooms. Including <laughs> mushrooms. <laughs> Two types. Whereas uh, the principle of Venom, which she associates with poison, death, but also jewels, bright colors, for her Venom in her writing is about choosing the most interesting and astonishing element to vary. So she uses examples of the elders arrested the young man for a crime. And so you could a very young man, so young man, young woman, whatever, or you could vary elders, leaders, so on. And it'd be more mushroomy variation. Mm-hmm. But what she did instead that she considers more of a venom generation is she has a database of crimes from medieval England. And so the elders arrested the young man for locking up the servants in the cellar. And that's much more unexpected. And so you get a greater density of surprise. Mm -hmm. And she talks about, uh, she theorizes that maybe one or two is the most you can have in a sentence. And it's because you don't want to have just a whole bunch of random stuff. Does it? Yeah, that makes sense. Turns into mad libs. Yeah, Yeah. it really does. And then um, beeswax is about bringing in pre-written stuff, handwritten content, or specific lists. Her example was she used the annals from medieval England, Mm -hmm. um, fictionalized it a bit, and used those to generate her corpus for the historical events that she references in the novel. Cool. That's somebody to keep an eye on for sure. Mm -hmm. No, I've been following her, following her on Twitter for a while and there's always interesting stuff coming out of there. And it's funny because recently, um, for work related things, I was having to look up, um, interactive fiction writing tools that weren't Mm -hmm. chat mapper. Um, and one of the things I came across was Inkle Writer. And yeah. so when I was looking up, like, okay, how do I use Inkle Writer to do a thing? Like, pretty much every tool, not just Inkle Writer, but every tool I sort of ended up researching, there was some Emily Short article or something about <laughs> Related it. To um, it. So clearly she knows her stuff in there that field. So. Maybe she's not actually a, a genius in this field at all. She's a genius in time travel, and she actually invented the, you know, the, the working time machine and has just gone and, and stolen from Alex. Mm-hmm. You know, and if that's the case... I am more than glad for her because <laughs> she's done more to advance the field. There you go. Which is weird because if you came up with the idea, and then I guess she she gets your idea, but then goes back before you and makes it happen. So exactly that means she gets the patent. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I played that game. Brilliant. Uh, so, any uh, sort of final closing thoughts on procedural generation in games, or in general, or things you're sort of projects you're keeping an eye on that you think are promising or interesting? Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of stuff that... Oh, you know the one you're going to talk about. Which one? Begins with the moon. Oh, moon, moon in it. Moon Hunters? Yes. That's coming out March 10th. <laughs> and it's procedural generated mythology created from your playthrough. Huh. I don't know a lot of details of it yet because it's... It sounds interesting. It's <laughs> not going to be out for another week or two. Mm-hmm. But it's something... I backed the Kickstarter, so, you know. It's, <laughs> it's something I've had my eye on. Nice. But there's literally an infinite number of things I could continue to talk about, including three separate implementations of Borges' Library of Babel. <laughs> As video game spaces. <laughs> so you can actually walk through and pick the books off the shelf and read them. Wow. Wonderful. Now, you've got a blog, right, about procedural generation? Yeah, procedural-generation.tumblr.com. Mm-hmm. Cool. Oh, you mentioned that at the beginning. So yeah. if you're interested in this topic, definitely go check that out. Once yes. more, that's procedural-generation.tumblr.com. <laughs> Technically, you can leave out the dash, but that just takes you to the other blog that takes you to a link that you have to click to get to the main blog, so... <laughs> hey, we, we like dashes here at backwarddashcompatible.com. It's fun. <laughs> and on that note, thank you everyone for joining us for episode 58 of the backwarddashcompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Doc. I'm Isaac. I'm Alex. And we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to 
hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Thank you.